uh, the thread open. If anyone wants to, to talk about anything specific or particular today, feel free. That's me. Yep. Okay, sir. Um, okay, so I, I know you, you will not interpret dreams, so I have a question concerning dreams. Um, I, I have these dreams where I can remember nothing I can relate to in, in words. But I know that it's a state of being um, that where it's all good, but not in a sense that there would be an alternative to good. It's all just wonderful, perfect. It all makes sense. I can see it all. I can see how everything functions and works and how it is put all together. And then there's the, the, the two of me and, and, and uh, the one uh, person inside of me keeps talking like, uh, write it all down, remember, remember. And the other person says, well, leave me alone, just relax. I, I remember everything anyway, because I know it all. So and that's the point. I, I already know what I see, all this perfectness, all this how things work. Um, but it's still fresh and new and just perfect. And um, when I when I get awake, even though I have some, um, I do know how to capture dreams and I interpret them. But these kind of dreams just keep slipping away so fast, and I cannot relate to any word. I don't have any words to describe what I saw. Um, so my question is: Do you, do you possibly know uh, what this state of being? Where, where was I? Um, I I I kept asking the Holy Spirit, and he just kind of give me his uh, grinny little grin, uh, like he does. Uh, so, but this is a place I, I need to, I need to, I need to go get back and I need to know how to get this place, this state of being here on earth. And where was I possibly? Okay, well, it, it sounds like you were, um, engaging eternal consciousness so you are re-engaging what you already know from eternity so it's your spiritual consciousness um so you're engaging the heart of the father you're outside of time and space um which is why it's, it's difficult to keep hold of it consciously but as you're engaging it it's beginning to rewrite over your normal consciousness and start to rewire your mind to be able to to be able to remember it and be able to engage it and I work from it. But it's not a, it doesn't have to be a cognitive process. Um, you find that the process itself will unveil things that you begin to just then know. Um, when I first started engaging there and I was going back into that eternal place and it, cause it's all now there and it's not the, the difficulty with words is they're linear in their understanding. All language is linear, whereas the language there is not linear, it's now. And that, that's difficult to put into words because it's a now um, non-linear expression. When I first started to go there, I had to leave my mind outside, if you like. I had to go there spiritually without the, I need to understand this, I've got to figure it out. I just had to be there. That's why it's the place of being. It's an eternal state of being without having to figure it out. But eventually, being there, continually being there, begins to remap your consciousness so that you begin to become aware of who you were. And that then begins to shape how you outwork that here, your destiny. All of that begins to flow out of those, those encounters that you have there um, but as, if you try and figure it out, then they're even harder to grasp hold of because you're trying to understand something eternal with something which is temporal. So you have to allow the eternal to transform the temporal into a mind um, that is connected to the mind of Christ and is not limited by linearity. Um, and it's just an ongoing process that you can continue to experience. So just keep going back there would be my encouragement. Just engage it, enjoy it, just learn to be there without having to try and do anything. Cause that's, that's the problem. We're conditioned into doing, um, rather than being. And the more you are able to be, 
the easier it is to flow in a, in a just natural way just to be and everything flows out of it. So eventually I did begin to remember things that I did as, um, as well as who I was before I came here. And that then connected me to why I'm drawn to certain things now my position within creation, my position within the kingdom of God, um, the position within light and the Sephiroth and the tree of life and all of those things made, made much more sense of, of how I'm wired to be here. Uh, eventually I discovered, yeah, that there is a very strong correlation between who I am there and who I was there and what I'm doing here. Um, but I didn't, have the memory of it then i just i guess was being drawn to follow my destiny um but when i did have memory of it it, it connected me in a, in a different way and in a in a way which became um, realized i guess and I, I began to realize things which um made me even more resting in it without having to try and figure it out or do it out so it, it was great no. so yeah keep keep engaging and it will it will begin to rewire your consciousness to to think from an eternal perspective not just a physical perspective and you sort of get the position in the middle where you are in the realms of heaven operating in the that realm from the eternal realm to administrate into this realm and you get the sort of, this is what it was like in eternity. This is what it's like to begin to administrate that in the realms of heaven. And then this is how this is going to be at work daily in my life. So you live from all in all three perspectives then. So the name of this realm was eternity. Well, yeah, I would say you're, you're engaging the heart, the eternal heart of the father in the now. Uh, it's the now of God's, where God dwells rather than his presence is. God's presence is within our time frame and we can, he can relate to us in the imminence of this time frame and yet be completely within the now. That's where he dwells. So his person is in the now, his presence is in our time frame and he is looking to engage us to align that eternal perspective into this physical perspective. And that's what our role is as sons um, to begin to outwork that. Um, it, it is a you know it's, it's a joyful place to be uh, yeah, but it sometimes can be confusing if you try and figure it out rather than just allow it to do its work you know yeah the more we are able just to be the easier it is to do you know, everything will change so yeah okay thank you okay, okay. anyone else Yeah, Jenny. Um, it's just it's a question about soul, spirit, and soul gates. Yeah. I just wondered how how fracturing of the soul affects opening soul gates. Um. Well, the f being fractured or dissociated will will mean that we're not whole, and then when our spirit and soul look to become integrated you're only integrated with part of you um, right. and so the fracturing or the dissociative nature or brokenness will affect how our soul gates function because they will be disconnected um, and when we become more whole then they become more whole <laughs> so so you can function in part but only to the degree that you are whole right. so they work but it's like having the sluice gate only a third open you're only going to get a third of what can flow through it so if you're if you're fragmented by two-thirds then those soul gates although they may be open and you may have an appreciation of them are only going to flow a third so becoming whole is a process you know which is part of um, not just understanding the, the soul gates, but actually seeing them fully flowing and functioning. 
And I think that's the reality in a lot of things. We can function to a level to the degree of wholeness that we have. And when you then come to the next level, it's not like the function's any different. It's just the cap capacity of that flow increases. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. People are, are in some way stuck emotionally or s fractured, broken, fragmented in some aspects. Um, mm -hmm. And the soul gates are more understanding how we function as a being, as a person. Um, we can still be understand that and still be broken. You know, that, that's, that's the reality of it. And God wants us to be whole, healed, restored, you know, completely integrated. Therefore, we can then function at increased capacity with the fullness of our emotions and our personality, which may have been in some way stunted or hindered or our growth hindered because of trauma and various other things that can fragment us or fracture us in different ways. Um, okay yeah. <clears throat> all right thanks so i had no idea really about fragmentation when i engaged my soul gates i just walked through them with jesus he explained them he and un helped me understand them i opened them but it wasn't until much later that something more of the emotional um process of transformation took place dealing with other my motives and things um, that then I became more whole and therefore more functioned much better and more seamlessly without having to really think about it too much. You know, it's just being again, once you get to that state of being so much easier for everything to work, but being is difficult when you're fractured. You yeah. Know? So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, Stephen. Hi there, Mike. Thank you for today. Um, I'm coming from a completely different angle, actually, uh, from the previous sort of shared words. Um, I'll use the operative word overwhelm. Okay. Um, I don't know really where I'm at in terms of what, what should I hook my eye into? What should I put my emphasis on? Because you're, you're engaging God material. It's it's so extensive. It's mm. huge. It's like a lifetime of material. Um, stuff with like um, uh, with Ian Clayton's material on Ignite Nations. It's huge material. And I'm five years a Christian that always wondered there's something else more. So I've got out of a church routine um, and I've got some experiences in, in this earthly realm that are very challenging, which is marriage and, and money hmm. and i'm getting to the point where i'm going i just don't know what to do now i don't know what to focus on i um, i feel like i've hit a brick wall and i keep on going into your website and other people's material and stuff like that i just don't know where to start <laughs> well i mean start at the beginning you know that that that's the reality i mean if you've been a christian five years you know i'd been a christian for for uh, well, 1972, 90, 2000, 20 odd years before mm. I even got to that stage. Right. You know, so, you know, five years is not a long time. You know, you have a lifetime. Jesus spent 18 years in a builder's yard ready for three and a half years of ministry, you know. And so, you know, don't, don't fret over, you know, trying to force things just relax you know the the key to everything is relationship so engaging in relationship of learning to hear um and engage the heart of god to, to hear recognize his voice to engage with the holy spirit and with jesus and to recognize them and begin to become familiar with them and therefore an unveiling of more who you are is the place to start i mean that, that's why the engaging god program is designed to take you from the beginning. Mm. You know, if you try and run before you can walk, you fall over. Mm. There's no pressure on being anything other than continuing the journey. Mm. We tend to feel pressured because the performance you know, has a 
a big part to play in in the world so but with god it's not like that he's looking at the heart and he's looking at the relationship he could do something in you in one day that would change the world yeah but that may only work if you spend the previous five years getting ready for that one day you know and we tend to want the day without the five years preparation <laughs> you know it, it is a marathon not a sprint you know and if you train for a sprint you're always going to run out of steam when you've got no, another 26 miles to go after you've done your sprint yeah. you know you know you don't set off at, at the beginning of a marathon sprinting you pace yourself and at the end, if you've got energy left, you may increase your pace to get over the line and, and whatever, but you don't, you don't have to sprint. So I would encourage you just don't, don't step out of sequence. Just keep the relational perspective, learning to hear, engage, then discover that intimacy on the inside and go from there. You know, it's no point engaging heaven without having engaged in the inside of you because heaven's got to flow through somewhere and if it doesn't flow through us there's no point being a gateway if the gate's shut so you all you just begin to engage the relational and in that relational is learning to trust god and i think that's where your your issues would lie with the, the things that you're struggling with it's trusting in god to provide to protect to direct you in that relational flow you know then you're not having to try and work it out and figure it out and make something happen or strive for something to happen or or try and get a 10-year journey into a into a month you know it's just never going to happen it may take you a lot less little time than it will take me because the pathway is there to walk along you know i had to stumble across most of this myself not re even realizing I was on a journey, but looking back, you can see how that's what it was. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it took me years to get to the point of being able to hear God clearly, you know, and, and to be able to talk to him and converse with him so that I knew his voice, absolutely, totally knew his voice. To start with, I didn't know whether his voice, my voice or anyone else's voice that was in my head, you know, but the more I, time I spent with God, the more his voice became clearer and the more I began to sense that, that what he was sharing with me was based in who he was, which was love, yeah. you know, and that became, you know, cause we all doubt, Oh, was that, was that me? Yeah. Where did that thought come from? You know, is that right? I don't want to get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And all of that, you know, is when we come to relax and realize, you know, that God is, in us walking with us on this journey and he promises to protect us and he promises to keep us following the path if we stick close to him mm. that's the key sticking close to him so you know every day i yoke myself to jesus i do not want to go into a field if you like yoked with to someone else taking me off in a totally wrong direction or i don't want to go into that field independently and plow my own furrow you know, I want to be with somebody who's walked this path much better than me. <laughs> and if I stick close to them, he will make sure that I follow the right thing, just keeping in step. I don't want to drag behind and I don't want to race ahead. I just want to take the, And that cadence is the rhythm of life. And that cadence that we walk and when you get that right rhythm, it energizes you. It's connected to the energy of life, the breath of life. All of that begins to enable you to live in a much more higher state of being, consciousness, and from that place where you're resting, walking with him, and just getting to know him. I mean, five years to get to know an infinite God is is just you know you, you you've got a a fraction of a dot there compared to what well who god is and you know and i might have a couple more dots than you but bottom line is i'm still on the journey as well you know and i'm still learning and experiencing and embracing and realizing more and more as i just walk the journey out every day so yeah just relax and and rest 
you know, I would encourage you to, to sort of do the meditation exercise, the rest exercise that's in the first part of the program. Okay. Cause that, that really gets you to a place where each day you can just get to the place of love, joy, peace at rest. And then things flow out of that place. You know, and, really actually in terms of pragmatics, um, yeah. I have around sort of half an hour to an hour, yeah. most mornings, Monday to Friday, and then it's, it's work. And then we can just, um, devoted to family life. So yeah, that's, that's all good. At the end of the day, you can, you can begin to meditate, you know, easily, you know, in love, joy and peace in half an hour. And mm. then you have, that will give you an, uh, an, a more insight into flowing with him during the rest of your day. Cause he's with you while you're working, you know, you, you, and you can be doing things while you're working. Um, spiritually, the, it's an ongoing thing. You know, you don't always have to be conscious of everything. Um, you know, but we can be centered in his presence and be aware and conscious of still being in love, joy, peace in life when we center ourselves at the beginning. And then you can just recenter yourself when you when you sort of find yourself drifting off because it's just coming back to that place. You know, I'm with him. You know, he's yeah. with me. I'm in him. He's in me. You know, and that becomes more of a a conscious awareness of his presence all the time. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Uh, Inga, you got your hand on there. Uh, yeah. Um, this uh, meditation that you mentioned, that yeah. has been uh, really helpful for me. And I started actually with the old, you know, the, the sheet that you handed out on one of the conferences. No. I started doing that. And uh, then I thought, well, um, this is some of what I'm experiencing, but I'm ex I, I want to remind myself of the other experiences, the other things that I have heard or seen myself. And so I started to write those down and to record uh, myself as I was remembering what I'd seen and experienced. And so then I put some music to it. And... And this was all to remind myself because I had a hard time concentrating. I needed something to just, you know, <laughs> to repeat like whenever I needed it, like in the morning or the evening or even during the day. And so I did this for myself. And it was like you know, meeting Jesus, being in the embrace of Jesus, going to the waterfall, uh, laying on the altar, uh, laying on the field. No, I, I didn't take that. But anyway, those things, the main things. <laughs> and uh, it really helped me because um, I was just experiencing it over and over again. And I really felt it was, it became more and more real. And then after a while, I could experience, like when I was out walking, I could suddenly remember, oh, yeah, the waterfall is here too. And so <laughs> I would just be standing under the waterfall there, wherever I was. And then I could say it to somebody, you know, uh, who was tired or needed prayer or something. I would say, oh, you know, but, but the living water is here. This waterfall is here just above you. It became so real to me. Uh, so then I made one more um, when, I mean, the Lord has really uh, helped me through this program. Um, I've not been in it very long, but it's really helped me uh, just mentally uh, to be peaceful, you know, <laughs> to feel more secure and so on. So then I, I made one more uh, about, about uh, experiencing the Father, meeting with the Father. And so then when I was like standing under the waterfall and looking up, this was what I was seeing first. I saw his eyes. And I saw that they were good and they were full of love. And, you know, he, I could see his eye. I mean, I couldn't see them clearly, but, you know, I knew they were there. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was like these huge arms were just reaching down from above and just taking me up <laughs> and carrying me along the river. And so I experienced this as I've been engaging the 
the New Jerusalem and, and the River of Life and, and all that. And so then uh, we came to uh, the throne, his throne, and he sat me on his lap. And I could hear what he was saying much more clear than, than what I could without the experience, I mean, without seeing all this, that I could, I could hear um, him saying things to me in a much uh, more clear way. So I recorded that as well. And I could see myself standing there, uh, you know, dressed in white and, and being accepted. And so uh, I recorded what I heard and it was really a healing experience for me. And so I, I listen to that too now and then when I feel I need to be reminded to, about it. Uh, and uh, I also share it with some friends that I uh, think that maybe they could be helped by it. And many of them are very, um, I think it's helping them. Mm. So this is just to share what the, you know, cool. what I've learned through the program. <laughs> I also have a question. Can I take that too? Or? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, it's about prophecy. So uh, if so I haven't uh, much experience in receiving prophecy, you know, and I haven't been in a church where there have been prophets. So a lot. So um, when someone says to you, God says, God says, you are for example, um, is that um, is that a good thing? I mean, I've been once, not very long ago, in a church where there was a uh, recognized prophet, and uh, he prophesied over all of us in the church. And first, I didn't want to take part of it because I thought, well, if God wants to say something, he will say it to me directly. Why do I need somebody else to say? And I was a bit, you know, suspicious or, you know, I just didn't feel. But then they asked me and so I, I, I thought, okay, you know. And, but what he said was like a confirmation of what I already knew. And so, uh, or what I was feeling that like I was saying or what I was feeling was happening in my life. And so I felt it was good. Uh, but as some of the time I felt like he was really struggling and maybe just um, it came from him wanting to say something to the person, you know, like it wasn't really from God, but, but he said some things, usually not very bad things. But so that was quite good. But then I have another experience in a meeting when somebody it was more like the person wanted to be like a medium, a mediator. First, waiting on God, speaking very shortly in tongues, then saying a few words like, God says, uh, this, 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 you are, you have, you like, you know, directly like God was speaking, taking the voice of God to the person that she was laying her hands on. And then she would, she would um, speak a few words in tongues again, and then she would say a bit more. And she would go on like that, like sometimes for half an hour, I mean, a long time, like she was the voice of God for that person. Mm. And I wasn't very, I, I just thought this is very dangerous. I mean, I didn't feel um, comfortable. And uh, the person also had, had a lot of personal problems, was broken herself and and uh, tormented herself. And I just felt maybe this was something that she wanted to please God or she wanted to help others. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, I'm, is this good? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, there are obviously gifts of the Spirit that are pro prophecy. and And those gifts are... Um, part of what the Holy Spirit can do. Um, but a real prophet is there to equip people to hear God for themselves, not do it for them. So prophecy can be on a basic gift of the Spirit, um, an encouragement, because it talks about in the New Testament, 
you know, comfort, edification, consolation. So that would be more of an affirm, affirmation and an encouragement that you, someone might be going through a difficult time and they're just encouraged to keep going. Yeah, that's, that's a positive thing. Um, when it comes to a prophet, it, it, that's different from a gift of prophecy. A gift of prophecy the Holy Spirit can give to anyone at any time if the Holy Spirit chooses. Ultimately, our spirit needs to learn to discern um, without the need of an external gift. We need to learn how to function our spirit, one spirit with him, and function in that way so we can discern life around us without the need for someone else, but in relationship with God. A prophet is there to equip people, not to do it for them. We've built a whole culture around prophets, prophesying through conferences and things, which draws people to hear God through that prophet rather than going to learn how to hear God for yourself. And a, a real prophet should teach people how to do it themselves, not just do it for them. Um, and, of course, people can be broken and people can uh, use gifts for their own edification. And it's not saying it's right, but they do. Um, and we're all on a journey of from where we are to where we're going. And for all of us, our hearts are not probably 100% pure. So, you know, we all probably do a little bit of doing things to get approval, either from people or from God. Um, that's just part of the journey of coming to maturity and coming to a place where we're more secure. Um, but I, I don't prophesy over people because God told me not to do it. Because if I did it, it would demonstrate the opposite of what I'm actually trying to encourage people to do, which is hear God for themselves. You know, and I, I have, I mean, I've done those things. I've prophesied for four or five hours over 50, 100 people until every one of them had a prophecy. You know, but although that was the gift and the spirit came on me to do it, I realized and engaging with God that that wouldn't be helpful, even though I could do it, you know, in the same way as interpreting people's dreams or telling people what I'm seeing, that's then becomes a substitute for them having their own interpretation and engaging themselves. You know, so I think it's, it is important to put things in their right perspective. God is wanting to mature us so we can hear for ourselves. That means not relying on some earthly mediator or medium for that to happen. Um, it can stimulate and it can encourage, but it shouldn't be a substitute for, and we, we must move on from the fact that, hey, great, we can hear, someone can hear God speak, to I can hear God speak. Yeah. And I can hear God speak because he is speaking to me all the time. I just need to learn to tune in and listen to those areas um, in that way. So, you know, people are all at different stages of their journey. And for some, a word of encouragement could be helpful. For me, you know, I've had lots of people prophesy over me in my life. I wish they prophesied re reality rather than nice things. You know, I would, I would, you know, I was challenging God, look, you know, if someone is actually seeing and hearing, why don't they actually speak the truth? Because I had all sorts of struggles in my life, and I would have been really happy if, if God hadn't acknowledged that through somebody. But he never, they never did. They only ever said nice things. You know, I'd much rather them actually have been honest and said, hey, you're really struggling, aren't you? God is with you or something. But they only say nice things or, you know. So, you know, I, I think there's a, there's value um, at certain points in our lives, but ultimately we need to learn to hear God's voice for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I, I really like your testimony of, of recording your encounters because, you know, they become a doorway for yourself to go back into, as you say, and for others to engage. Mm -hmm. And I know quite a number of people who have done that. You know, we've used some of them on some of our, in the conferences, we have a, we had a page, I think, up of links to 
other exercises where people are sort of engage the garden or the tree of life or different things and they're very helpful you know because they're they're a starting point for us to go through and to re-engage a, mm -hmm. a past experience is an opportunity of a doorway into present experience mm -hmm. um, so it's great you know mm -hmm. God. yeah awesome mm -hmm. okay all right okay anyone else Yep, okay, and was anyone else who's not asked one first, then if no one else wants to, I'll go back to Sarah. Anyone else? Right. Okay, all right, Sarah. Um, there's this uh, discussion going on, then the question uh, whether or not the uh, spirit, the human spirit can be uh, polluted or fractured in any way. Mm. And, so far as I understood it now um, from the teaching, I would answer no. It might seem like that, but it, you could just put it like that, that the, the, the gates of the spirit are blocked or, or yeah. somehow clogged up. And uh, but, but our spirit can be fractured. So the, how would you put it? Can our um, spirit yeah. be fractured? Polluted? Okay. I, I, I would personally say that the spirit cannot be fractured. Uh, the spirit has come out of from God. Um, it, it was cr you know, made um, out of Him, um, but it can obviously be blocked. And what generally happens is the soul projects onto the spirit its brokenness. So, for instance, some people who look to open their first love gate within their spirit, where God is dwelling within us, and they find that it looks like it's padlock chained full of barbed wire you know all sorts of pictures images that means it's so difficult to open it well the reality is i think that's a that's a projection of the soul which is very powerful because that's what imagination can do it can project images it projects it over what you're seeing to actually keep you safe so for the soul that has insecurity opening a gate and allowing god in can be quite a difficult thing particularly if that people don't trust and they've had experiences with authority figures or whatever else or they have experiences of being damaged in love so first love for some people would be a terrible experience of being let down and and abandoned or betrayed or hurt you know, my first love experience was was extremely damaging to me um, because you know I was I was really emotionally damaged, and I made a vow not to be hurt again. So I closed down emotionally. Now, fortunately, by the time I got to open my first love gate, I'd been healed of all that, and I had a lot of healing that dealt with those issues. So I had no issue of opening the first love gate when I saw it. Other people, you know, testify that they can't or they don't think they're able to because of this projection of the soul's wounds to keep the soul safe. So there's a, a, an unwillingness to take risks, particularly when it comes to love, you know, and emotional things. Also, outside of the spirit gates, there can be other spiritual things that are in place that stop the flow from spirit to soul. So particularly if you have, let's say your first, uh, within your spirit, you have reverence, fear of the Lord. Now they are very key in helping us develop discernment to be able to make right choices based on whether they're going to um, be reflecting the heart of God for us or not. And so our conscience can be uh, empowered by first love and reverence. But if you have a religious spirit operating in your life that can sit outside of that, those reverence gates and fear of the Lord gates, and they can actually twist the reality of what reverence and fear of the Lord is to actually become a very legalistic thing. So fear legalistically you can't do that you'll get it wrong fearing god's you know, wrong view of god all coming out of a legal because that's what a religious spirit can do sat there trying to influence the flow 
or block the flow. Um, now, that isn't in our spirit, but it can be outside between spirit and soul, if you like, within the where they're supposed to engage. That, that can happen. And you can have lots of different uh, things sat there which will stop revelation, for instance. Let's say, you know, your revelation gate, um, which can flow and, and flow in revelation and fear of someone, let's say, prophesying wrong or getting it wrong can again be a blockage. And uh, you can have spirits that are designed uh, to actually stop that flow and hinder it and, co and cause confusion. So th that can definitely happen. Um, it's just a matter of dealing with those familiar spirits and getting a flow, uh, getting the gateways open and flowing and walking through it with Jesus and sort of getting, getting things integrated and whole. But absolutely, um, I believe the soul can be very powerful in hindering or keeping us safe, but it usually out of brokenness or woundedness. Um, and that's something which often causes us to feel separated and to feel not not integrated and to feel you know at risk often you know these are quite powerful things familiar spirits look to um, mimic your spirit and operate as if they were you <laughs> and your soul can buy into that whole process because the soul um, has have all those experiences of life which tend to um, be negative um, but i don't believe the spirit itself is fractured or broken uh, i think this is very important for, for me at least for my self image as i see myself when i when i look at myself who is me from this perspective of eternity to think of me of not having a spirit which can be polluted and I think this is a really important subject mm -hmm. and it can be a real hindrance if people see themselves that their spirit can be polluted because then there's kind of nothing left which yeah. they can connect to yeah so. yeah no, I, I, I agree with that um, what I feel is that our spirit and soul are separated um, on purpose to stop the pollution or to stop the soul uh, hindering um, the spirit in our, in our, on our journey. And then when they become reintegrated, when you separate soul and spirit, because there's a, a connection that the soul has to the spirit, soul ties, once they're separated, then the spirit can create soul ties uh, to, to bring a healthy flow spiritually from heaven through our spirit into our soul. Um, and that redresses the balance that was there probably when we started and we first get to know God, our soul and spirit were in competition because the spirit is a realization of the, the life that we have, then begins to try and outwork that life. And the soul is, has been used to being in control and therefore resists. So you get this tension between soul and spirit. Um, but the, the, as our soul, as our spirit gets stronger, then our soul um, resists less, you know. And ultimately, once once we get to that point of surrender, then the resistance is gone, and there's much more of a oneness. Yeah. So I don't I don't even think about soul and spirit as being separate anymore, because they're integrated, and it's just me. You know, but it's me. Forward to that. Yeah, and it, but it, it feels like me, who I was always intended to be, rather than the me who has memory and history of experiences of life, and those experiences sort of disappear really as as the uh, more of the reality of who we are, and we think according to who we are. That's got a greater influence than the memory of things that might have happened to us. And and they're, they they over they're overcome. Our spirit gets stronger and stronger and edified, and we become one and more whole. Uh, and it does feel good, you know. It does feel very different <laughs> from yeah. the tension that used to be. Um, yeah. But you know, it's a journey and a process. And you know, I had a particular process through that journey, um, which 
worked for me in my life and everyone's got their own different process that God will bring them to that point of surrender. You know, we, he wants all of us to get to a point where we surrender the right of the soul for independence um, and embrace um, who he made us to be in relationship. And, and that, that did change everything for me because I learned, I trusted him, you know, whereas I thought I trusted him, you know, and I, actually I was trusting him when I knew what he was doing. And when I didn't know what he was doing, I realized I didn't trust him. You know, but I, I now trust him. It doesn't matter whether I know what he's doing. I don't even need to know what he's doing. I trust him. And trust is now, you know, totally that way. It's just trust rather than what it used to be was, well, I needed to know because then I felt safe knowing. Um, and now I don't need to know and I feel safe anyway because I'm safe in that relationship because I trust the relationship. He's my dad and he wants the best for me. And even when things go awry, usually because of my decisions, he still wants the best for me and he'll bring good out of even decisions I make which weren't the best because that's his desire. There is no, he is going to punish me because I've made wrong decisions. He's going to use those decisions to help equip me, nurture me, train me. So I make better decisions in the future out of desire, not out of fear. Because, you know, Fear is what is a wrong motivator. And if we're fearing God in the wrong way, it can cause us to not trust him and therefore hide from him or avoid him because we don't trust him through fear. And that's why religion has painted this picture of an angry God who needs appeasing that we should be afraid of rather than a loving God that we can embrace and honor and respect, um, but not, we don't have to be afraid yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Oh, uh, Mike. Yeah. Hi, Ronald. Oh, nice to see you back again. <laughs> 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 um, what experiences with uh, elementals behaving like um, conscious, conscious beings, you know, speaking and responding and so so um, and as the Holy Spirit well what's going on and if these are uh, actually living beings or conscious beings or what you said um it's not um like we imagine human consciousness but uh, they can give an account of themselves um mm. something similar like going to a museum with a pair of earphones on and um standing in front of an object and that object um other object there you get a recording of what this um, thing is about and um, something similar to that, not in a form that we understand uh, human consciousness. But, yeah. Yeah. I mean, th there's quite a lot going on today around elementals and how creation, is it sentient? How is it sentient? How does it respond to us? How do we can connect with it how is it groaning how is it longing you know how is creation itself we understand that in people we could understand that in in beings you know angels um but how does something which seems inanimate or is living but we wouldn't see us having some sort of sentience like plant life or trees or the ground or the air or the wind or you know, water um i think there is a a sense where there may be some confusion over spirits which are associated with those things as opposed to elementals which are seemingly sentient but are not spiritual beings as such and therefore they're different but they can be communicated to and they can communicate and they can effectively operate because they were designed by God to help Adam and Eve maintain creation cultivate and tend it and steward it they were there to help them but when they gave up their right to that and gave that away then they can also be influenced by other things and therefore you know god did not create um wind if you like to destroy things but as a result of us 
um, not in a sense ruling, then it's like it becomes something that can be used for harm that was never intended to because it can be influenced by other influences. So when Jesus stilled the storm, you know, peace be still, there was a sense where there was something behind that. Now, there were two influences behind it. There were that which caused the storm in the wind. So those will be elementals. And then there was a spirit behind it, which stopped, wanted, not wanted Jesus to go over to the other side to deal with legion. So there was, there was a influence that influenced something that could influence weather. And you have people who can do that. So people who are operating as Wiccans or they're operating in, um, in some witchcraft type stuff, they know how to engage with elementals and influence them, usually for harm. Not always, but often for harm. Um, and those people can be influenced by spirits, by the enemy, who's looking to influence them to do harm, and therefore they can do that. Um, so I think there are you know, different levels of things. I think the confusion comes where people talk about water spirits and, you know, all this, you know, which I agree there can be water spirits, but they're not elementals, but they can influence elementals. So elementals are supposed to be influenced by us to respond to our sonship to keep things functioning as God intended. So whether they be the ground, the trees, plants, whatever, as well as wind, water, fire, all those type of elemental things, um, I believe that they are supposed to respond. They responded to Jesus. I do believe they, they're looking for influence. They're, they're, in a sense, they're, they were designed to be stewards, to help. And they were designed to be stewards of our sonship, and they've been stewarded by other things, let's say. That's my view on it. Now, we need to reclaim our sonship and start functioning with that stewardship again. And they will respond to us. Um, but they need to recognize sonship. Um, and what they've recognized is authority within people rather than pure sonship, but they've been influenced by that authority. And influenced by spiritual dynamics um, that are, is still in place, whether it be you know, the atmosphere of the earth or other things where there are still uh, spiritual beings that have a negative influence to influence the earth. So how does the atmosphere of the earth with principalities, powers, rulers, affect the earth? Well, some of that is through people, and some of that is through elementals, um, and some of that is through other spiritual beings. We call them demons or you know, unclean spirits or other things. All of that is a sort of seemingly a, a different level. So for me, demons are different than fallen angels, and both of them are different than elementals. But all of them can function and have a role to play in our lives um, but we need to make sure we know our authority so we're not going to be negatively influenced by any of them. But we will have authority over them. And in the right circumstances, use those influences correctly for the government of God and the kingdom of God to be manifested on earth as it is in heaven. Um, but I think this is probably, mm, although people have talked about elementals a uh, in the past, probably not in such a way that they're indicating there's a sentience about it um, that is supposed to be engaged with. Um, and I think that um, seemingly is becoming something which is being unveiled. Um, I know people who are doing court cases have found that elementals have come into the court and have given an account of why they've been influenced to do what they've been doing to create hurricanes or wind systems or weather patterns or whatever it might be. And they seem to indicate that they have been influenced by others. And therefore, um, when you're dealing with that, you then need to call for what has influenced it. 
to deal with what was behind what was influenced, you know, to find out, well, what legal right did they have to, to do this and then get the verdict and take it, take back the position of authority that that yeah, unveils. But it is quite an interesting, um, I think, process that people are going through at the minute. Um, realizing, hey, there's a lot more to sentience, conscience, creation itself than people may have, you know, thought. Um, so. well, there, there seem to be, um, and I've seen living beings that uh, seem to be made of pure wind or pure fire, and things like that, so that um, like dragons that made of ice and. Uh, Obviously, not, not carbon-based, um, mm. as we know. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, it, it is a, a sense there is sentience, um, but they're obviously made differently and therefore can function like that. You know, um, whether, whether some of it is symbolic, you know, when you see a dragon or whatever, it's obviously a symbol of a, of a force, of a, of a authority uh, and usually usurped authority. Um, how you deal with that obviously depends on the legal right and how you, how you then deal with it. I think some of it seems to be quite an aggressive stance. Uh, well, I'm going to chop its head off and I'm going to spread it open. And I'm going to chop its tail off. But in reality, a lot of that is just symbolic. You know, I'm going to remove it. So you can't kill a spirit. You know, you can't kill something that's come out of an eternal thing, you know, God. So you can't kill it. But there's an indication that we think people think they're killing it because they're coming with this aggressive, I'm going to take the sword of the spirit, I'm going to slice it open or whatever. And it's symbolic of, well, I'm going to remove its authority. I'm going to chop its tail off because that's the sphere that it's got access to and i'm gonna you know split it open to get back what it may have robbed or stolen uh, but you're not literally doing that you know you know in reality you know it's not a literal process it's a spiritual dynamic that you're enforcing and outworking um it may well be that some of these other things can uh, function out of the elements that they're representing so fire and, you know, and I, and I did hear talk of, and this was, this came through some sort of court case or whatever, where some of the forest fires um, in the US were deliberate and were elemental fire to actually destroy forests, which were for good. Because, you know, we wouldn't survive without forests. You know, they, they, they put out masses of oxygen and suck up masses of CO2. So without, you know, extensive forest systems around the world, you know, you know we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't survive very well. So there's, there's a balance, an ecosystem balance that's designed for us to live in health. Um, and there may well be, you know, some of these elephant fire things was wiping out those good trees. You know, and you get, you know, the Lord of the Rings, you know, the Ents and Treebeard and awakening of those elementals. I mean, I think that's what they were represented by. But then they were there for our good. You know, but they'd lost sight of that. And they were a bit like, mm -hmm. we're making this decision based on well, who, what influence. And eventually, you know, they responded. Now, science has discovered that trees do communicate with one another through an underground mycelium of network of communication that they can communicate you know in the lord of the rings films eventually they also uprooted and moved and helped them deal with the whole issue in the second film of you know um two towers so you know i think you know someone like tolkien had probably some insight into things which he's made put in a very uh you know visual form but i do think there is some insight there that we're supposed to reconnect to and rediscover the stewardship that we have for creation but also working with the stewards that god has given us to help our stewardship so and i think those what those elementals were designed to do uh, so, yeah. 
I remember reading that, that um, article about the trees the, that connected with the internet of um, root systems and fungus and whatever, and they can communicate to another tree hundreds of miles away about um, dangers and yeah. things like that. Absolutely, yeah. And I think, you know, I think that's just a, just a, uh, a, the tip of the iceberg when you come to all of this understanding of creation and how it can have some emotional um, abilities and can and and function you know and i think we will discover more and more and hopefully as we come into a more mature sonship we will learn how to work with them and they will be stewards on our behalf to do things for us to bring the restoration of all things as god intended you know he intends restoration and that will be a restoration of what the original function of creation and sonship was and is and how it's designed to func work together and not be separate and independent and you know, in, in discord rather than in harmony. You know, God wants to bring things back into a harmonious place um, and that will bring everything back into the right balance in that harmony uh, that he, he originally intended and we walked away from and now he wants to restore us back to. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, I've got time for one more. If anyone's got anything they want to throw in there. Okay, anyone else who's not, not said anything yet? This is your chance. Okay. Okay then, Sarah. Cool. I've got loads of questions, but I'll choose this one. Mm -hmm. um, the, the court cases. Uh, I think the court cases for me are a really, really, so uh, the mobile court, I haven't gone any further, but the mobile court, and I think to me it's a very relieving thing uh, to um, put my feet on, on the ground of God's righteousness and justice, justice. Um, so, and then um, I, I do quite a lot of court cases and um, I've seen some effect to them. Um, but usually there comes the moment where you um, it, it, uh, um, command that the uh, accusations are to be made heard. Mm. And then there's this moment of, will I hear anything? And I, I must admit, I don't hear quite a lot of things. Sometimes I don't hear anything at all. And um, sometimes I just hear, okay, unforgiveness, which of course makes a lot of sense for, for, a, lot, for a lot of cases. Yeah. And so, so my, my question is, what's wrong? What's wrong? What, what's going on when I don't hear anything? And for the case of unforgiveness, Okay, I'm I'm at it. I'm going. I know where I have unforgiveness, and I'm I'm really at it to sort out where are my um, where's my part of the uh, the side and uh, what's what's not. So I'm, I'm separating which is mine and which is not mine. But that's a process, of course, as well. So yeah. it, do I need to be finished with forgiving until I can? say okay the court case is done or is it enough so that I have an attitude of okay I'm really working at it so and it, so then the other part what, what do I do if I don't hear anything okay um well yeah if you if you're still working through forgiveness then you don't have the final verdict until it you've actually outworked it in a sense by by owning the accusation and saying yes I accept that I'm in unforgiveness God can give you the verdict that then empowers you to outwork the forgiveness. But unless you do, then you're not going to function fully and there would still be the process to go through. Um, and it, it is, it is one of the fundamentals of court cases, you know, is, is actually not holding anything against anyone else because that's what Jesus has done to us. So you have the whole parable of the, um, you know, unforgiving servant who has, was forgiven everything and then didn't forgive a small thing. And so that was a, in Matthew 18, which talked about the key there 
to choosing to forgive from the heart and uh, we obviously do that in an unconditional way not based on whether someone's made amends or put it right or he asked us for forgiveness we choose to forgive because it's for our benefit not not just for the the person that we're forgiving although there is benefit for them we're not holding them to account um, and that opens up the reality that that god can minister to them in a way which he wouldn't if we we tie them to their offense um so there is that and i think you know my key my thing would be make sure that you you know look at every area of your life not just with court cases to live from up the perspective of forgiveness as a lifestyle when you engage the accusations sometimes there can be um more than just hearing something sometimes you feel it sometimes you sense it sometimes you get a memory a th you know it's not always that you get a clear word sometimes when you engage it there can be something that takes you on a little bit of a process for you to discover what it is um, and so sometimes you know if you don't hear anything specific then i wait to do am i feeling something you know am i sensing something is there something of the feelings that uh, are going on which is a clue to an area that will then lead me to understand accusations that might be against me in a more clear way sometimes it's almost like there's a precursor to having a clarity about what accusations there are because our emotions are clouded and our, our senses are not very clear and we can sort of follow a little bit of a journey towards it to become more clear and and that's no problem um, it isn't always you know a a clear word it can be very very much more sensing and feeling and and sometimes a memory of a of a of an event or something that happened and it's like well what's that got to do with an accusation but when you then go back to it you'll find there was something associated with it that will open up an understanding for those type of accusations to be clear and sometimes there may not be any accusation so you may not hear because there isn't any you know and, and that that's you know particularly if you've done a lot of work it's not always going to be necessary an accusation attached to everything um because you're out working an ongoing process i think the key to the the verdict is to apply it some people think it's an automatic thing great i got a verdict the problem is solved no the verdict gives you the power to outwork that to remove the problem that can take time and particularly when it's tested you know um, and the testing can come um, to say do you know the verdict and often we have if you're dealing with something which is an habitual pattern of behavior or thinking or that they can be neural pathways that are triggered by triggers of people's words actions that trigger you and you end up spiraling down the same response or reaction to that trigger because the neural pathway is still in place and the memory at the end of the neural pathway is the negative one i apply the verdict to the neural pathways to break them then the verdict becomes the pathway that i go to when i'm triggered so i'm triggered you know, and the verdict is i respond out of the verdict of i'm free from this i don't need to think that way act that way respond that way because i'm free but that requires some renewing of the mind so the the truth which is the verdict replaces the lie which was the old pattern and on now although you've got a verdict the the habitual instinctive responses need to be dealt with and that means applying the verdict to it and taking captive every thought and applying it and i think breaking neural pathways are key to the renewing of the mind so then we have a different thing at the end of it which is the positive rather than the negative so we form a new neural pathway linked to freedom rather than bondage um but that's that's a a process that 
I've not seen that many people really do. And they, they, you know, I've seen people do court cases and they just want an instant, everything's changed. I've got no problems. It'll all be gone now because I've got a verdict. Well, the verdict is just now you have authority in your life to at work. If you don't outwork the authority, the verdict is useless. You know, like like any verdict, it has to be enforced. You know, if someone has a not guilty verdict, enforcing it is they're set free. If no one sets them free, the verdict isn't isn't actually applied. The same thing with guilty. If no one locks up someone who's guilty, then the verdict may have been given, but the reality is it hasn't been applied. So the application of the verdict is key in seeing its enforcement in our lives in that practical way anyway all right i need to i need to finish now because i've got a, something else to get to but i will uh, 